Welcome to our Community Conversations lecture series, our first one of the summer semester. Uh, this semester, we're going to be focusing on immigrant communities um, and their impact on American life. And this is our first session where we're going to do a historical overview of immigration uh, to the US, but specifically focused on New England. Um, so I'll quickly introduce myself for anybody who has joined us for the first time or um, is unfamiliar with me. I am Dr. Lisa Wisniewski. I am an associate professor of sociology at Goodwin University, and I mainly serve as the host of these sessions. Um, today we have um, a special program. Um, we will have a quick lecture by Dr. John Kanya, who I will introduce in a moment. So he's going to give us a historical overview of what New England uh, looked like, how immigration has shaped New England life um, over the last 170 plus years. And then we're going to have a discussion about the convert about the topics that he presented. So at any point, please feel free to type questions into the chat box. Um, I'll be monitoring the, the chat box or we'll open up for discussion after he provides his lecture, okay? So I now get the opportunity to introduce my dear friend and colleague, uh, Dr. John Kanya, who is an associate professor of English and ESL at Goodwin University in East Hartford, Connecticut. He began his career in education at the elementary level, teaching nearly all grades from preschool through graduate school. John grew up in the Polish diaspora community in Worcester, Massachusetts, and has had the opportunity to work with a number of immigrant communities in Norwich, Connecticut, and Lawrence, Massachusetts. John is one of Goodwin University's Universal Design for Learning, UDL, trained teaching fellows, and his primary area of expertise is developmental English. <laughs> John has presented. John has presented on the international level with myself, Dr. Wisniewski, at the World Educational Research Association, and has co-written a chapter with me on the New England Polish diaspora community and their college aspirations for an international peer-reviewed journal. John has also presented at the International Symposium on Second Language Writing, the International Roundtable Symposium at Oxford University, the New England Educational Asso Assessment Network, and the New England Educational Research Association, NAID, South by Southwest, and the CAST UDL Symposium at Harvard University. John, thank you so much for sharing your background and your knowledge with us today, and we look forward to your lecture. Well, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Geez, uh, my colleagues can later debate uh, that wonderful introduction, but uh, I just want to talk about immigration to New England. And I want to, from the outset, talk about the fact that the focus is going to be a lot on Europe because uh, American uh, immigration laws favored Europeans. And it, I just Think about the Chinese exclusion laws that were part of, you know, for many, many years, part of why um, the Chinese did not emigrate or immigrate here. Um, I'm going to use immigrate and emigrate, I and E, interchangeably, but the E will emigrate is more uh, leaving a country permanently. Okay, so um, in that case, when I talk about the Hmong population in uh, Lowell, that's that's clearly em emigrate. So if we could start with a quick PowerPoint, I'm just going to do a quick 20 minute overview and then um, we'll have a discussion. So the initial slide is uh, from the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. Uh, it is a National Park Service uh, 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 site and um, it just, you know, it's, it's a quick illustration of uh, the how workers lived starting in the 18, 1860s. Um, this is uh, uh, Polish workers living in the factory row houses. So the first uh, group that I'd like to talk about uh, is are the Irish. So if, uh, if we can move on, uh, coming around the 1860s, the Irish come to New England uh, in force. And if you think about when the Irish potato famine happened, it is in that in those era, in that uh, time frame. Um, one thing I'd like to note is if you have a chance to go to the no Lowell National Her Historical Park, which is a National Park Service uh, site, they walk you through the mills. They walk you through uh, the, the row houses. And starting in the 1820s, 
<clears throat> we see mill girls coming from Ireland. <clears throat> so, uh, and they are single and they are the, the economic engine to a lot of the textile factories and manufacturing in Lowell and surrounding towns. The Irish are also here to, to build. Um, they build, uh, they are uh, one of the largest groups to build the Blackstone Canal. And that is a canal that uh, joins Worcester and Providence. And we also see a large uh, Irish population in settling in Boston's South End, Southie. <clears throat> it's interesting now, if we look at Southie, how Irish Southie is, and we can have uh, we can have a conversation about the the uh, demographic shifts of some of these immigrant populations. The next group are the Italians, and uh, this is a picture of St. Anthony's Festival in the north end of Boston, uh, and it's a recurring festival uh, and. We know that Italians settle in the major cities of Boston, Worcester, Hartford, Bridgeport, Waterbury, and Providence. And, you know, if you think of Providence, Federal Hill is where the Irish um, enclave was. In Worcester, it was the Shrewsbury Street area. Boston is the North End. So uh, one of the questions that we ask is, you know, how, how, do we, how do we figure out or how do we note the presence of an immigrant group. And that is a question I'm gonna hold off for the next slide, which talks about the Polish community. Uh, Lisa and I have done extensive work with the, in looking at the Polish community. Uh, so the Polish communities have, um, have, were extensive in New England. Let me just say that. Um, the main Polish diaspora communities uh, can be found in Boston, Worcester, Webster, Mass, New Britain, and Waterbury. Uh, the picture, which really doesn't do it justice, is a picture of St. Joseph's Basilica. Uh, it's the fo first Polish uh, Roman Catholic church in New England. So we know that Poles uh, started settling in, 18, in the late 1880s. Um, and more, uh, most likely for uh, job opportunities, manufacturing. Um, it, there, is a Poli there was a Polish community in Southbridge, Mass, who um, were the, were the uh, workforce of American Optical Company. In Worcester, it was Johnson Steel and Wire. Uh, in, in, in Lowell and Lawrence, it was the textile, um, textile manufacturing. Uh, this is an interesting group for us, for Lisa and myself, because we see the some of these um, still very, very strong, while others, such as Gardner and um, Gardner and Southbridge and West Warren, these small little towns that had Polish communities, no longer uh, can no longer be counted. Um, interestingly enough, a new Polish community was reformed in Salem, Massachusetts. Um, and, and part of my, my uh, research, I would love to see how, how come it was reformed, where it is going, where's the strength in that, in that particular community because it had, been, it had been kind of dormant for a while. So moving on, we can look at the French Canadians. Uh, and uh, Ram Ramirez's book uh, in 2018 chronicled the the uh, French Canadian uh, migration to the U.S. the The book is titled "Crossing the 49th Parallel: Migration from Canada to the U.S." And the majority of French Canadians settled in New England or in Michigan. Um, and the main destinations for these French Canadians were Massachusetts, Maine, uh, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island. So when you look at uh, the initial immigration, it was northern New England. It was moving from the farm areas uh, around Quebec to uh, Maine. Then later on, we see a movement to southern New England. And here we see a lot of French Canadians um, moving to Lower Lawrence, the textile areas, and manufacturing for those opportunities. The question is, how do we 
how do we gauge the presence of an immigrant community? I mean, you can use census records to a certain extent, but how do you, you know, how do you know that it's, that an immigrant community is is strong and vibrant enough? And one of the key uh, pieces of that is, um, especially for French Canadians and for Poles, is their their building of places of worship. When churches and synagogues start to be built, you know that the immigrant community has enough financial resources to build an edifice like that and then to build support structures, you know, organizations and clubs uh, around those churches. And many of those, many of those organizations and clubs are for naturalization, uh, you know, getting citizenship. So if you look at the French Canadian groups, they're settling in places like Lewiston and Waterville, Maine, uh, Manchester and Nashua, New Hampshire, and Woonsocket in Central Falls, Rhode Island. And they're all, in, 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 to a certain extent, coming here for, uh, for employment opportunities. Next, we're gonna, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, both the Chinese and the Hmong communities. Um, and I put them on one slide. This is a, a picture of uh, Chinatown in Boston. There were, in New England, there were large Chinatowns in both Boston and Hartford. And uh, Hartford's Chinatown no longer exists. And the question is what happened? And it's the same thing that's happening to, the, to Chinatown in Boston. Demographic shifts, uh, urban renewal, gentrification, all of those uh, factor in. In Chinatown, it was uh, the Mass Pike and building the Mass Pike through Chinatown. So uh, that in itself is, is quite interesting because they've held on for all this time since the, the 1900s. Um, but in a, in a review, New York Magazine uh, did a review of how has Chinatown stayed Chinatown in 2015. And the author, uh, Nick Tober, said that in some cases, these Chinatowns are nothing more than ethnic theme parks, which is an interesting um, uh, take on how some Chinatowns have shifted to the point where they're shells of what they what they uh, were, uh, were once were. Um, one of the more fascinating uh, immigrant communities is the Hmong population of Southeast Asia. Now the Hmong group were uh, originally in China, but they migrated to other countries in Southeast Asia, such as Thailand. And they started coming here to the United States in the 70s as a result of war and conflict namely the, the Vietnam War. Um, and UMass Lowell has uh, the Southeast Asian Digital Archive, and they are working diligently to, to uh, chronicle the, ch the challenges and the journey of the Hmong and Southeast Asian groups. And uh, because many of them, many of them in their process to coming here to the United States, ended up going through refugee camps. So um, UMass Lowell is working hard to archive this, to interview those uh, individuals and you know, t have them tell their story about these refugee camps, about the pain and suffering that they, they went through to find a place. And the largest, the second largest Hmong population is in Lowell, Massachusetts. The largest is in Long Beach, California. So it's interesting to, 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 to think about how these immigrant groups find their way to certain geographic areas. And in this case, uh, Lowell is, is uh, the city that invited a large amount of uh, groups. The next and uh, last we're gonna talk about that I'm gonna review is the la Latino immigration. Uh, and there is, uh, a wonderful book, a 2017 book by Barber uh, 
that talks about Latino immigration specifically to Lawrence, Massachusetts. And uh, initially, most of these uh, groups, Dominican, Puerto Rican, and Cuban, uh, initially were staged. They, their staging was in the Bronx and Brooklyn. And then when they found textile uh, job opportunities, they then settled in Lawrence, the, the Lowell uh, and Lawrence areas, especially Lawrence. So initially they came for, they came for uh, jobs, but the textile industry then collapses. There are no jobs. Suburbanization happens. So the su suburb of L Lawrence is Andover, Mass. And Andover, Mass becomes uh, much more economically feasible for most people. Um, Raytheon decides to build a plant while the textile mills, the big warehouse mills, lie empty and deteriorated in Lowell and Lawrence. But the immigration to Lawrence is steady throughout this time, even when manufacturing collapses in these mill towns. And this is not only happening in Lowell and Lawrence, but happening in these, what, what some would consider these rust belt old manufacturing cities and towns like Holyoke, Mass. Then how, you know, even after they can't find jobs, they're still coming here. And the question is, what, what, is, what is the motivation for them to come to an area where the job market is relatively scarce? The Barbara points out that for most of these groups, they are coming for safety reasons. The upheaval in their own countries force them to come to, you know, in some cases, force them to come to the United States. They settle in places like the Bronx and Brooklyn, where they, again, they, they don't feel all that safe. So they you know, due to the economic upheaval and the political upheaval and their financial upheaval, they find their way and settle in these, what are now termed gateway cities, Lowell, Lawrence, Worcester, and Holyoke, Massachusetts. Um, that in itself is, is interesting because we see it's not necessarily for economic reasons that they, they come, it's for family connections family, the need to, to keep families together. So the last slide, we can talk about the current immigration to New England. Um, I had the opportunity to, to teach in, in Norwich at um, Three Rivers Community College and had an opportunity to work with the Haitian population that uh, settled in the Norwich area and uh, the Dominican Peruvian population that settled in New London. Um, and for the majority of that, those immigrant groups, they're coming for jobs, much like a group that I didn't mention, the Portuguese. The Portuguese settled in uh, New Bedford and in Fall River and on Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket primarily for fishing. We have now uh, newer immigrant groups like the Dominicans and um, Haitians coming in as unskilled labor, but being trained and then trained in the manufacturing areas uh, of, of uh, that particular area of East, Eastern Connecticut. In Worcester, we see a large uptick in uh, the Ghanaian population. And in various cities of Connecticut, we have um, Afghanistan and Syrian groups coming in. Now, there was a, a four year uh, kind of slowdown based on um, the Trump administration's limiting of, of uh, immigration. We now see that uh, since the, the Trump administration, there will be, uh, and there, it, there is an uptick in immigration. So what are the question, one of the questions that uh, come to mind is, you know, uh, how, how do these groups 
find their way? And what, uh, what are the factors what, that cause these, th these movements where we see some immigrant groups staying put in one area like Lawrence, where 60% of the uh, population of Lawrence is Spanish speaking, um, where others have since dissipated and, and, and disappeared to, to um, you know, when, when we're trying to do a count. Uh, when we look at a city like Lawrence or the, the other major cities, you have suburbanization. You know, once an immigrant group uh, gets the financial footing they need, they move out. They, they leave the, the area for the suburbs. Uh, Deindustrialization. Um, Lawrence is unique because they didn't have to go through urban renewal. They didn't have to go through, you know, a lot of the, the, the uh, Dominican population specifically and the Puerto Rican population. They built businesses because there was nothing there at the point, at that point. So the deinvestment in in those large cities became an opportunity for these immigrant groups to come in and build their own infrastructure. So having said that, um, the question is, you know, when we look at immigration, what's the extent of family and social networks? You know, uh, what is the extent of job opportunities? What is the extent of gentrification? Uh, Chinatown in Boston, rents are getting sky high. Uh, urban renewal has caused Chinatown to be squeezed. They're squeezed between Tufts Medical Center and everything else. So, I'm, I, I, I've, that's all I need to say. But Lisa, we, we have some questions that uh, any, but does anybody have any questions or any thoughts? As always, please feel free to write in the chat. We do have some follow-up questions to John's uh, presentation that I'll be asking him and continuing to discuss. But if we have any questions, we could pause that for a second. And I do see Dr. Dixon has his hand up. So I will I will say hi, Brian. Hi, Lisa. Hi, John. Uh, thanks for that, John. Uh, just a, a quick question to follow up on some of the things you said in the presentation. Uh, you commented on the potato famine uh, spurring Irish immigration to America. I wonder if either of you, Lisa or John, could comment on Polish history. Are there specific moments that you can point to in Polish history that might have led uh, to immigration to the United States? I know for my family, it's the big obvious one. It's World War II in the immediate aftermath of World War II, the family came over uh, to Connecticut and, and has been there ever since. So, but I wonder if there are any other key points in Polish history that you can think of that made it uh, spurred immigration to the U.S. in particular. John, uh, we know Polish Polish history has been one of uh, invasion and being conquered it, because they were between two major powers. They were between Prussia and you know the what is now Germany and Russia. Uh, so Polish history is one of uh, being you know the, the the country itself being wiped off the map for close to one hundred years. So that kind of economic political upheaval uh, is, you know, was the basis for a lot of, of immigration. And uh, we see now, uh, we see now that kind of uh, thing happening. You know, the reports are that uh, Russia is, is having a brain drain uh, based on the current situation. Uh, when, people, when people see that economically, you know, it, it's getting more difficult, politically maybe getting more difficult, they have to find options. If you look at Poland now, immigration has pretty much, it's down to a trickle when it comes to the United States, simply because Polish, uh, the Polish young uh, youth have the opportunity to work within the European Union. Mm -hmm. So uh, a friend of mine, his cousin, works in Ireland for IT, for an IT firm. He can take one of the cheap airlines and do a long weekend and go back to Krakow, Poland, you know, very cheaply and still have that connection. So 
you know, they're finding other opportunities uh, within the European Union that they're not necessarily uh, going to see here in the United States. Interestingly enough, uh, in the United States, demographically, the, the largest Polish population outside of Warsaw was in the Chicago area. It is slowly, um, it's slowly shrinking because a lot of the Poles are retiring to places like San Diego, California and Phoenix, Arizona. And to sort of add to the, to answer the question, Brian too. Um, so there's multiple waves of immigration from Poland to the United States since the 1800s um, due to some of the factors that John had mentioned in the late 1800s. Poland didn't really exist on a map. I, to John's point, Poland has been overtaken and reestablished multiple times. We used to be quite a large kingdom in the 1500s and now we're a fraction of that. So the first essential wave is what John sort of started speaking about was most of the immigration was zachleb for bread because there was you know nothing there and we really weren't Poland. Then came the waves of immigration due to World War I and World War II. So that was immigration for safety, right? So we see immigration for uh, refu you know, seeking um, safety. And then the, a more recent one, there was a continued uh, immigration between the 60s through the 80s, but especially the Solidarność movement. So I don't know if you're not familiar, in the 1980s, there was a workers uh, movement called Solidarność, which translates to solidarity. And that was, many of those events led to the fall of communism in Poland and Eastern Europe, right? There were many things that were happening at the time, um, but a lot of people were either, um, kindly asked to leave, right? So I have friends who their fathers were involved in the Solidarność movement. And when they were tr captured, they were given an option, tell your, about your friends or leave the country. And they were literally just dropped in different places. So um, I have a friend who lives in Sacramento, California and one that lives in Australia. They were intentionally very separated or individuals who were left, who left for opportunity. My family left um, in the 60s and the 70s, um, you know, more so for rejoining of a family um, here. So my parents didn't necessarily see Solidarność. Um, but here's one last interesting fact. One of the leaders of the Solidarność movement became the first president. His name is Lech Wałęsa. He was in Connecticut two weeks ago, and he has been advocating for um, the Ukrainian community here. So he was in a series of meetings. And why I'm saying this as a fun fact, uh, he got a flat tire in 84, leaving an event in Hartford and a state trooper had to help him. So the former president of Poland was in Connecticut not that long ago doing this work, talking about the role of the constitution in a country. And he happened to have a flat tire just outside of Goodwin. You know, so that's, sorry, Brian, that's a very long way to answer your question. Um, but, you know, showing how these connections are still very alive today, right? Um, but yes, in, especially in Polish immigration, you see what John spoke about, leaving for safety, leaving for security, right? And leaving for opportunity. Those are like the big ones that we see that is not uncommon in many immigrant groups. So I hope that answers your question in a very long way. Sorry, Brian. No, it was excellent. Thank you very much. No, no problem. Any questions, any others before I get to the questions? While um, Lisa is going to the questions, my family history includes my father who was a prisoner of war in um, Stalag 8. And when he was released, the Red Cross uh, gave him the option of going back to Poland, which he knew was pretty much you know, destroyed. Um, or, or emigrating to the United States, and he married my mom, um, and then we, they shortly came over to the United States, and uh, the rest is history. And it's interesting, they, they found uh, initially Southbridge, Massachusetts, the Polish community there, and then settled in Worcester because of the availability of jobs. Yeah, I, family history is, I mean, I'm sure you all want to hear the questions. I, this, this is just making me think of my own family history, and I'm sure that's not what you're here for, but always happy to share. We could always chat a little bit after that. Um, but, you know, 
So actually, John, what I'll do is we have three questions, right? But this seems to be um, a conversation that's going to our third question. So unfortunately, I'm going to go out of order for you right now, but it seems to flow with the conversation, right? Which the question was around family connection right? So what is the role of family connections? You, you left your lecture on this part, right? You know, what, so let me explain that a little bit further. One of the trends we see when you study immigrant groups is when one person gets over here, they start sending back for family members, right? When one person has the opportunity to do that, they start sending for family members to arrive, right? Um, a lot of immigration laws dictate this. Um, my mom, it took my mom 14 years to bring her sister here. She started in 1980 and my aunt arrived to US in 1994. The only way that they made that happen was my grandmother became a citizen and it became a mother daughter, not a sister sister connection, right? Um, and that provided a lot of um, issues. So what is the role of these family connections, right? Whether it's talking about immigration coming to the United States, or what about even the conversation you and I are having now, where we're talking about family histories and these diaspora communities and how they're shaping our interactions today? It, it, that, that has to be a critical component, um, simply because when Barbara looked at the Dominican uh, population in Lawrence, the questions asked, they're a thousand miles away from a Caribbean island. How in God's name do they find their way to a Holyoke, Massachusetts or, you know, or a Lawrence, Massachusetts? And, and the question is, you know, initially they, they did their staging. Their family started to, to come to the Bronx and the Brooklyn where the larger populations were. And then family found, oh, they heard about a job opportunity in Lawrence at the textile mill, and I can bring my cousins there. And, you know, there the family connections started with job opportunities. But then again, like I said, when the, the textile industry collapsed, people are still coming to these, these uh, places because the choices for them seem to be limited. They, their economic choices, you know, in the Dominican Republic in the 50s, uh, you know, American imperialism, uh, you know, caused them to rethink where they, where they were born to come here and settle in a place, take the risk and see where, where that leads them. Um, but without those family, those strong family connections, we may not have seen the pull. Another uh, major connection was the religious connection. Mm. You now, um, when I think about uh, the building of synagogues and churches, uh, especially in, in central Massachusetts, in, in Worcester, there were two French Canadian churches. There's one large Polish Roman Catholic church, the synagogue uh, that, you know, brought over a lot of Russian Jewish uh, immigrants, you know, but now we see the demographic shift. Now we see these groups moving to other areas. And it's interesting to see how they've pivoted. Uh, you know, St. Peter's Church used to be Irish Catholic. Now it's Brazilian Ghanaian. Uh, because th those neighborhoods have switched in terms of the immigrant populations that now that now house it around that particular church. You know, and the role of the laws, right? Kind of to the example that I even just gave of my mother, right? My mother got here through, you know, in a very different way than she needed to bring her sister over, right? By then she, my, my aunt had a family, my mom was single, right? My mom got married here, you know, established her life there. She had a very different experience in terms of how she can come over versus how her sister could come over, right? Based on the laws and what the purpose was, right? My mom left before Solidarność, my aunt left after Solidarność, right? Two different economic, um, political and economic areas. So I think one thing to also keep in mind is how laws change and can dictate a lot of these things, but also thinking about um, per, uh, agreements between countries, right? And how that also can shift who can come, when they could come and how they could come in a very 
broad terms. Lisa makes a great point. Uh, when you think about uh, Poland, the, they limited the amount of men who could leave because uh, men were the work uh, the primary workforce. So it would be it was almost impossible to get a visa for a um, you know a, a man over a long period of time. Think about all the Irish young young girls, young women who were coming over to the textile mills. Now I. Uh, it was only late in the in the textile manufacturing where we see men being hired, you know, like French Canadians and or Portuguese. But the majority of were women. Women were the workforce in the textile mills because there were no limits on uh, placed on them uh, to come over. Uh, it, it's well documented that some you know laws here, and I, I point out the the Chinese exclusionary laws. And laws in the home countries limited who could come, when they could come, and you know, and and sometimes that was a struggle to get the family unit together. Absolutely, um, John. I'm going to break for one second because Ken did ask us a question in the chat box. So, and I'll come back to our discussion questions. But Ken is asking: Is there a difference between the, ref the refugee and the immigrant experience? The immigrant experience, well, that, that's an interesting, that's the, that's the difference between immigrant and emigrant, right? If you, uh, if you are a refugee coming here, chances are you're, you're looking at this, this situation in more permanent settle, settlement terms. Uh, if, you know, the Hmong population knew that they were, they were uh, in, in, tough, in a tough place, especially suffering through refugee camps, so that when they came here, it was for permanent settlement. Uh, it was not necessarily to, um, you know, when they, the choices that we have are, can be based on, to a, to a large extent, what is happening in our home countries. Mm -hmm. it, we are seeing a demographic shift among the Polish population. A lot of our older retired Poles are going back to Poland. Mm -hmm. And they, because their social security checks can get sent over there. So we're, we're seeing those demographic shifts. We're seeing Polish populations going down south, mm -hmm. you know, like snowbirds versus a good popular, a larger population going back to Poland where they can live within the European Union and still have the, the, you know, lifestyle that they had here in the United States. So. It is truly dependent. Uh, when I was working with the Haitian population in Norwich, it was at the, around the time of the of the uh, earthquake. There was a mad rush by many, many of the families, uh, Haitian families, to try to get as many family members over here, and it was a struggle. Um, but you know, once, what are the opportunities back there versus here? Is a, is a key point to, to, to think about. And thank you for that question. One thing I'll add to that too is sort of pathway to getting to the end country, right? So if we're talking refugees and immigrants, it may not necessarily always be immigration to the United States. It could be to Canada or other places. But oftentimes that pathway um, isn't perhaps as straightforward. What I mean by that is they may be leaving their home country, go to a refugee area for settlement, right? Which we may be kind of seeing it with what's happening in Ukraine right now, right? So for example, many uh, Ukrainians are, I think, what are we like 2 million in Poland at this point? Mm. They have up to 18 months of staying in Poland, right? But in that 18 months, what's the pathway of where they're going to go? Are they going back to Ukraine? Are they going, you know, are they going back to the home country or are they moving somewhere else? So it's not perhaps as straightforward of a process when we, versus when we see immigration, it's sort of the, I've made the decision to leave. I've gotten my paperwork together to head to the new country, right? And you're sort of more of a linear path versus in, with refugee, it may not be as straightforward and you may not know where you're ending up based on how laws 
change, right? So in that 18 month holding pattern that they're in now, is the US gonna open up the borders? Do they have to go back to Ukraine? For example, I know I'm jumping between a couple examples here. Um, is the e European Union gonna open up? We, we don't know right now what that looks like, right? Um, I'll, I'll, often, I'll also share a story. I have a friend who's just a little bit younger than me. Um, his mom left uh, Poland when Solidarność was happening. And at that time, a lot of individuals who were leaving Poland had to go to Italy first and wait, right? So there wasn't sort of this direct path to, um, to the United States or Canada. Well, guess what? She was pregnant with my friend at that time and she gave birth to him in Italy. But what happens is he's not Italian. He did not get granted Italian citizenship because he was born in this area that was like, hey, you're here, but you're not really from here. He's not Polish. He wasn't born in Poland, right? Because he had left. So this newborn is a citizen of where? Based on laws, right? Based on the agreements. They ended up moving to Canada because Canada had a pathway for these individuals to move and retains Canadian citizenship. And interesting enough, he's a citizen of the world. He's lived in more countries than I can even name or have visited because that is his pathway. And sometimes I wonder is how has that early experience shaped him, right? So even thinking about identity, nationality, right? How does he identify? What, what does that mean for these, you know, for example, children or people who have left? So, Back, back to the questions, right? Um, we have a few more minutes. Um, so John, you spoke a lot about how cha there's changing demographics, right? You know, we can talk about the, you know, communities that were developed in the early um, immigration to the United States, but as you've mentioned many times, things are changing, right? These things do not look like they did years ago, right? These communities, I shouldn't say things, these communities don't look like they did um, years ago. So what are the trends that we're seeing with these communities, with the neighborhoods that we sort of know and love? And I'll, I'll, I'll before I stop talking, I'll make a plug here. Like, for example, I live down the road from Little Poland, New Britain, Connecticut. It's a historically Polish community. Next Sunday is the Little Poland Festival, if anybody's bored. <laughs> it's gonna be a whole day event here. I'll make a little plug here. There's a festival coming up, right? First one in three years. So we're seeing some of that Polish community here and even what I just mentioned. Yeah, but, but, what are but, it, but it's truly interesting. When you think about the goal of most immigrant groups, it was to come to the United States for whatever reason they had, you know, political stability, financial stability, whatever. But the goal was to get citizenship and then assimilation, become part of the American fabric. And most, uh, many of those groups were extremely successful. Now, uh, and that's where we get the, you know, when we, we think about the, the uh, author who stated, you know, uh, some of these neighborhoods are nothing more than ethnic theme parks. Mm you know, how, how, what, what's the critical mass of those people in those neighborhoods? If you look at the North end of Boston, you know, you see, you go down the, those streets and you see Italian restaurant after Italian restaurant after Italian restaurant, you see, uh, you know, the St. Anthony festival, you see these, these, you know, uh, regular parades and festivals honoring the Italian saints in Italian, you know, uh, culture. But when you look deeper into some other neighborhoods, they're, they, they've become shells because of assimilation, which was the goal, but has now come back to haunt many of these, many of these populations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you still, in, in many, in many places, we see now, the, the Chinatown of Hartford was a vibrant Chinatown until urban renewal and gentrification happened. And things, you know, Hartford decided to move things around and build housing. And, you know, people are, were squeezed out. Um, so for many of these, and, and this, is, this is important for, for researchers like Lisa and myself, we look at how vibrant these uh, these ethnic enclaves are. What are the supports that surround them? Because if you look in, 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 at the community in New Britain, 
there is there are a number of Polish organizations and support uh, systems in place around the churches. You had, you know, uh, you had uh, Polish organizations, Polish veterans groups that all worked towards helping the Polish population at the time. Now, if you look at some of the newer immigrant groups, for example, in Worcester, the Ghanaian population, they struggle because they haven't yet found the financial resources to build that support system that they need. While there's, there is a critical mass of, of Ghanaians they still struggle because they're trying to get these supports, these organizations, these clubs in place. And that is not always an easy thing to do because it takes financial resources. It takes, uh, you know, a group effort. And, and, you know, it was easier for some groups because they focused around their religion, build a synagogue, build a church. Um, in, in this case, it's not always as easy for some of the for some of the immigrant groups that are coming much later. You know, I think that's a fascinating point because what we saw in you know the early 1900s up until I would probably argue the 1960s, and we saw a lot of clubs and organizations that helped had created resources, right? Um, in terms of pathways to citizenship, in terms of incorporation into American life. For example, there's, I feel like I'm, I, I have all anecdotal stories today and I hope these are helpful to our lecture, right? Um, there's a well-known manufacturer in Newington who in the 1950s is credited with bringing over many Poles from Poland, um, helping them get settled. He had housing available. He had obviously had a job because he had a manufacturing and he helped them transition into life in the US. Are those supports still available? I mean, the main, in that particular case, they are not anymore. The company is still open, but the person who's running it has since moved on, right? So thinking about those supports, those pathways that we had. Um, and as you were speaking, I, I kind of smiled because I just remembered um, we have down the road, there's a building that used to be the Polish Democratic Club, right? That's, that was the point of it. It was a, 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 a club. Today, it is a nightclub. The building still stands. The Polish Democratic Club has been taken off. It is called the PD Club and it is now a bar and a nightclub. So thinking about how that one, I just, I just had a visual as you were saying that, right? So thinking about how these institutions may still be around, maybe the buildings, but how they've also shifted in terms of their purpose. Yeah. Can, can you make an, an extremely important point? Um, you know, there was much discrimination amongst the immigrant groups coming. Uh, you know, in, in the early Boston, in the early times of Boston, when you saw, you know, in a, in a window uh, of a shop, uh, you know, help wanted, Irish need not apply. Now, that is true of many of the, many of the uh, immigrant groups that are coming and are, that came and are since coming. Um, you know, Barbara talks about the serious discrimination amongst the Latino com communities that were coming to Lawrence. You know, it was it was serious. And then you add to the neighborhoods that they came to, which were redlined by the federal government. You know, redlining was an important it was, it was a, a problem that, you know, provided its own layer of discrimination. But, you know, when they headed to these neighborhoods, these poor neighborhoods, it was always it was always going to be a struggle. It was always going to be a challenge. And it's interesting how um, maybe we need to document the, the ways of which these immigrant communities found their way, um, you know, to 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 move out of these particular enclaves. Uh, some immigrant groups like the North End, the Italians, you know, they revel in in making sure everybody knows that they're there. But for others, it, it's always been a struggle. But that's an excellent, excellent point. You know, one thing I would add too is, um, you know, thinking about not only their development, but also their sustainability, right? Or to, to John's much earlier point too, is, you know, 
what is the number? How do we record who is somewhere? Because I'm sure there, there are groups that we have not mentioned, right? And there are groups that are coming in, you know, and how are, that is um, also always the issue as a researcher right now. This is one thing that we come up uh, a, a, in having a lot of issues with is how do we find the people, right? Because they don't, sometimes we also haven't talked about legal status, right? They may be undocumented, they may be documented, so they may not report. How do you identify? Because identity, right, has shifted so much. Who do we capture in the census, right? What data are we capturing in that, right? Um, you know, is it identity? Is it ethnicity? We don't, we don't do that necessarily as much anymore. And then the other part I'll add, you know, I'm saying multiple parts in this. I just had this conversation with a colleague of mine too, also thinking about the generations of immigration. So, uh, you know, we've all, I'm sure, heard about being first generation um, American. There's also first generation immigrant, second generation immigrant, third generation immigrant. First generation immigrant is a person who immigrated themselves, right? So the, my parents are first generation immigrants. They came from Poland. I am a second generation immigrant. I am the child of the immigrant, right? And then my children, I don't know how that's going to be because technically my husband's the first generation immigrant, right? So they're like two and a half, I guess, right? But the third generation would be, you know, the grandchildren of. And this is our session um, on social capital, which will come in late June, thinking about those experiences and how those shift based on the immigration right? So oftentimes what you see is the first generation immigrant is focused on survival. Let me get a job. I have a roof over my head. I've gotten over, um, you know, I've gotten into American life. I'm fine. I'm surviving. I'm sustaining. But then the pressure on the second generation is you go to college. You, you know, move on to that next step, right? So then the focus shifts to immigrant, to education, right? While retaining the a, you know, values and core of the, the culture. And then the third generation becomes much further removed from the first. There you might see loss of home language, right? You may see loss of culture and traditions. That's where I see a lot of my classmates sometimes have said, well, my grandpa, my grandma was Polish, but I don't speak Polish, right? Or, you know, whichever it is. So also understanding how that shifts families and family life and also opportunities. Right, so that's that's a whole session of itself. I opened a whole different door. That's that is one. That's probably like a, a series in and of itself. Um, but also thinking about what gener what generation within that, and what is sort of the focus of each one, because that changes their experience as well. Lisa uh, brought up a point that um, a book by Nicholas Gage chronicled his. Uh, he come. He's. Uh, Greek, uh, he comes from a Greek immigrant family. And he, when he first came over here, he spoke very little English. And when they put, they, the best place they could put him in the Worcester Public Schools in Worcester, Mass, was in a special ed education class mm -hmm. uh, because he didn't know the language. This is prior to ESL and, and, and you know, uh, all the support systems available now. But he, he clearly suggests that, you know, for, uh, young children and, and young adults coming over here, the struggle is real to learn the language. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some some may learn English as a foreign language oh, in their home country, but it's not the same coming over here because there's a cultural element. Um, and learning that culture is is probably more critically important than, you know, learning the words and, and adjectives and, you know, all those other grammar pieces. Uh, for, for Gage, though, he, he, you know, his children and went to Greek school. Uh, there are Polish schools set up so that, you know, the idea of we're going to allow for assimilation, but we don't want you to forget your your roots, the, the culture. Um, and so a lot of those schools are set up through churches or through, you know, different organizations to keep that cultural element and language element alive. Um, and that that's that's something that needs to be studied, too, because it's an in some cases it's an international movement. Um, when I when I uh, spent some time in England on vacations, it um, amazed me walking in London how much Polish I heard. 
<laughs> because the Polish are one of the largest immigrant groups um, now in in England. Uh, so, to highlight, just in Connecticut, we have three Polish language schools: Hartford, New Britain, and Bridgeport. Just yes, I went to school on Saturdays when I was a kid. Why did my parents make me do this? I complained all the time. I had to go to school on Saturdays to do, you know, Polish school. That was my argument every Friday night. No other kid has to do this. But anyways, we still have those schools. And instead, and, and in fact, since my time, they've expanded into high school level. I used to just go second grade through eighth grade. Now they're in the high school level. Um, and to add about learning English, again, today's my day of just examples. To John's point about learning English, right? Culture is a huge element within that. My mother shares that, again, she came in 1975. Uh, she learned English effectively watching soap operas because they spoke English slow enough that she could actually hear sort of the words, but also the interaction. Mm. My husband learned English effectively was through music in the 90s. Hmm. understanding sort of the cultural context specifically that, ex that explains a lot of his vocabulary <laughs> specifically rap music interestingly enough <laughs> as it's that's an interesting thing because how fast it's spoken right and think about the 90s and 2000s right sort of very different topic areas as well right so a lot of times we're seeing individuals learn english through media channels is my point. For my mother in the 70s, it was soap operas. And a, a, a young boy in the 2000s, it was rap music. I know we're, oh, I'm sorry, John, I'll let you. Yeah, I just, I just wanna uh, point out, uh, we shouldn't forget, and we should keep my, be my, very mindful of the challenges faced by many of the immigrant populations. Um, and Ken mentioned, you know, outright discrimination uh, for the Russian Jewish population, it was anti-Semitism. There were layers upon layers. Um, you know, the struggle was has always been real and has always been uh, something that has to be overcome. It's not just a language barrier. It's not just a cultural barrier. It's, it's you know, looking at options, employment options that are available. Um, my ESL classes at Norwich at Three Rivers Community College, the ESL, uh, the people who were who uh, were in those classes worked mainly for the casinos and they wanted to learn English to better themselves so that they could move to perhaps managerial positions within the casinos. So, you know, when, when if, if we leave on the idea that the challenge for many groups is real, the Afghan families who are coming here, who know they can't go back and have to find housing and have to find some sort of, you know, financial subsistence, as well as, you know, putting their children in schools. It is a real challenge and something that, you know, we've seen generations, generations come um, and, and have been successful or somewhat successful at but uh, you know the newer populations need to. We need to think about those who are coming now. I appreciate your time. I thank you um, for this opportunity to speak about something that Lisa and I are seriously passionate about. Thank you. I, I will quickly ask. Um, I have a couple of announcements, but quickly ask: Does anybody have any questions? Last comments? Anything? And then I'll talk a little bit about it. Announcements. No. Thank you all for coming again. Uh, it's great to see some familiar faces and some new faces to our series. We will be continuing this these sessions um, throughout the summer. We have another three planned. One last one is pending. I'm just waiting to hear back from a speaker, um, but we have um, three more sessions coming up. I just put the link in the, in the chat box for our next one that's coming up on June 9th. Um, and it is titled the Immigrant Narrative where we're gonna hear from two individuals who immigrated to the US and speaking actually directly about their experiences um, in moving to the United States. Um, so that will be our session 
uh, in two weeks, right? Um, so that link that I uh, put in the in the chat box, please feel free to register, um, and it'll be a very similar format. Um, there probably won't be a lecture that time, but more so of a panel discussion asking these questions. Um, Thank you again for your time. If you want to chat about anything, John and I will stay back for a few minutes if you want to sort of have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, dialogue about anything. And um, otherwise, thank you so much for your time today. And we look forward to seeing you in our next session on June 9th. Have a good one.